before we start talking about the next topic, which is Karma, just wondering if there's any questions or, or comments that anyone would like to make about what we discussed yesterday. Um, the statement that nothing nothing stands outside of cause and effect seems like a pretty blanket yeah. statement. It is. It's right. a very blanket statement. Um, on on what basis is that statement made? Well, it's it's an inference on the basis of carefully examining. All your experience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at least that was at the time of the Buddha. Later on, there were a, a very famous uh, person who was a brilliant magician by the name of Nagarjuna. Uh, basically, uh, used logic to demonstrate that uh, a lot of these things that the Buddha had said, and this being one of them. Uh, Stood, could be demonstrated logically, though. Okay. But uh, uh, and interesting, uh, Nagarjuna demonstrated a, a lot of things here, like uh, that. That, uh, for example, the Buddha saying that causes and, and effects arise together, and not in the way we normally think of it. That's one of the things that he's. That Nagarjuna is famous for demonstrating is that linear causality is not possible like, mm -hmm. right, from a logical point of view and mm -hmm. so forth. So. Okay. But yeah, um, just, just to make it complete, in the Buddha's description of reality, there actually is one thing that does not arise due to causes and conditions. The unconditioned, the unborn, the unchanging, and the unceasing, and that—that that is nirvana. That is, which is a negative, an absence. Of, it's a negation. Okay. And then later on, when the notion of, of emptiness was developed, then the same thing applies to emptiness. Emptiness is is uncreated. So those, in, in you, could, you could kind of call this a, a, a Buddhist cosmology. I mean, usually when people say Buddhist cosmology, they refer to what is really a non-Buddhist cosmology that involves deva realms and, and uh, human <laughs> realm and animal realms and hell realms and so forth. But a, a, a real Buddhist cosmology is there's everything that's due to causes and conditions, everything that is uh, as a result of rises due to causes. And then there is uh, nirvana, emptiness, and Buddha nature, which don't arise due to causes and conditions. And they are equivalent to ultimate reality. <laughs> right? So so that's so when you complete the circle you get back to ultimate reality. That's not that doesn't arise dependent upon causes and conditions. Okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, you have described the nirvana state as unceasing. And yet everything is couched in the language of the negative. It, it, it still implies there's something going on. That there implies a something, there implies a dynamism. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it, is it dynamic or static? So what, what, the thing is, your mind is always going to make it into a kind of dualism, because, you know, okay. yeah, um, and uh, I mean, you, you you can conceptualize it, but any way you conceptualize it is a model, and any model, if you look at it closely enough in the right way, fails. So you just you just have to accept that when you see that you make a conceptual model and when you reach the point that that model fails and realizes the fault is in the model and, and you can find another model which won't fail in that particular way but it will fail in some different way. 
and then the the correct response to a failed model is to return to experience. Well, uh, <clears throat> yes. The worst thing you could do is start <clears throat> to doubt direct experience on the basis of the model without questioning the model first. Mm -hmm. And it is true that we are misled by our experiences. And sometimes a model can point us to the fact that that we're misinterpreting our experience. Okay? So you don't want to automatically disregard a model's failure because, well, that's not the way it seems to me, you know, in my experience. Because the model might be telling you that you're misinterpreting your experience. But at the same time, the model is just a model, and it's equally possible that the model has failed. And so you have to you have to look at it in that more even handed way. Yeah. Well, you have to look at it, and of course the things that you can do, you can pursue your experience more deeply, which is a really important thing to do, and you can also try to re, uh, redo your model, rework your model. So the language that says unceasing, which suggests to me a dynamism, it could go either way, it's, it's a, a problem in the language? Well, yeah, well, the thing is, it's suggesting a dynamism. And then, what do you mean by a dynamism, and why is it suggested to you? Because, I mean, after all, uh, an, 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 an emptiness, an absence, an, an absence can continue without involving what I would think of as a dynamism. Right. Right. Yeah, but in 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 which case it's it's static, which I haven't really gotten the idea anywhere in here that it, that we just pulled a plug. It, it is. And, and absolutely, that's not the case that we just pulled a plug. What, what we're doing is, is we're, we're continuing on, but we're seeing and understanding more clearly. See, static and dynamic are dual, a dualism. And what we can infer about ultimate truth is that it's not dual. Okay? So. Which is another negation, non dual. <laughs> now you're just making my change. But, but, but the thing is that, you know, what is much easier for us to deal with is to switch non dual to the positive, which is unity, oneness. And of course, our mind can make oneness into a lot of false ideas. But that's why it's useful to always have non duality in the background so when we start making unity into something that we shouldn't, then we can check with non-duality and see where we're making a mistake. That actually made sense. I'm oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is, yes? Um, where does empty space, hmm? does empty space, or the sky, fall into, is it also, um, is, is, is it brought about or not brought about by causes and conditions? Empty space is used as a metaphor uh, for, for emptiness and nirvana and things like that. Uh, it's, it's a metaphor to help you understand uh, something that could be uncaused, unchanging, and, and unceasing. She's asking if it's caused, has causes and conditions. What's that? Empty space, if it has causes. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't have, it's, it's uncaused. It's, it's used as a metaphor. Empty space itself. Now, once again, if we start looking at this carefully, we'll run into all kinds of problems. Well, what is space, anyway? And what is empty space? Empty space is something that's unoccupied, but can space exist without some kind of reference? You know? If you have an object in empty space, 
Now you've got space to the right and the left and above and below and in front and behind. But without a referent, it gets a little bit, it starts to lose its meaning. So we've got two things, we've got space in between them, right? So uh, as long as we just, when we're using metaphors, we kind of have to take them at face value. Imagine empty space. Now empty space, does it need a cause? No, it's just there. Does it change? No. It just, it just is. Yeah. And does it cease? How could it? It's, it's empty. <laughs> so it's a metaphor. Okay, but yeah, I, if we start examining space, though, from the point of view of logic and physics and everything else, it's not going to work as a metaphor anymore. We're going to get to a place where <laughs> it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. I see the I mean, that's right, because even in a vacuum, there are subatomic particles like blinking in and out of existence and stuff like that. Well, well that's really an interesting thing, is, uh, is the, uh, the vacuum fluctuation, of something from nothing, you know, that, uh, and even uh, now there's pretty strong theory saying that actually where the universe came from was, was nothing, that there's, there's this vacuum energy, that's something from nothing. And it's interesting, if you go to the descriptions of ultimate reality, God, things like that, it has to encompass both being and nothingness. You know? And so then it starts to make sense. Well, ultimate reality, well, yeah. God created everything from nothing. Right? <laughs> ultimate reality encompasses nothingness and being both. But just to point out to you once again, we're never going to intellectually nail this whole thing down. And what we can do is, you know, we can become philosophers and theologians and speculators, and we can spend our lives thinking about these things and discussing them, and that's a lot of fun. But without the kind of intuitive realization the changes the way your mind works. When you go home from your speculation every day, you, you're still the same suffering being. And so, all of this intellectualization is just, it's just an aid, and the goal is to change our intuitive way of viewing reality, to make it something that works a lot better. So there is one statement on this slide here that I just wanted to call your, from yesterday, I wanted to call your attention to, right here at the bottom. There is no room in this holistic view of reality for separate processes that come to an end independently of the whole. The problem with the notion of self is we always ask this question, you know, what happens to the self? And there's only two logical possibilities. The self goes on or the self is annihilated. And the reason that the Buddha was able to resolve this problem was that he realized that there was no self to either continue or be annihilated. And that's really where everybody, you know, it's like, okay, I am this being, so when I die, do I go to heaven or do I get reincarnated, or am I annihilated? And when we say, well, you're nothing but uh, these five aggregates, then it's, oh, so myself is these five aggregates, and when these five aggregates fall apart, I cease to exist. I'm annihilated. And that's not what it's saying. It's saying that there is something real, these five aggregates. That's the person, and that's an individual person. But what those five aggregates are, when we e examine them, first we find that there are all these different processes taking place. 
and then when we when we understand it more fully, we realize that well, they're not they're not it's not a collection of separate processes; they're all parts of a, a one large whole process. And so you have to we revert to the holistic view of everything. Everything taken together is one single, totally integrated process, totally interconnected process. And so this, this, this is what you really are, but there's no separation in it. You are a piece that you imagine to be separate from the whole. But what you really are is you are totally inseparable from the whole. And you don't cease as long as the whole continues. But it's just the particular manifestation in the form of these five aggregates. If you become attached to these five aggregates as yourself, then you're going to experience the pain at the idea that since these five aggregates are due to causes and conditions, they're going to pass away. But the coherence that they hold from the time of your birth till now, some, at some point, the, that coherence is going to diminish and there's no longer be identifiable as a separate individual. But you haven't ceased to exist. You've just transformed. You've taken a different form. Okay. Is there, an, I sort of understand vaguely what you mean by reincarnation, but is there a way you can talk specifically about reincarnation? Just... Reincarnation is, and what we're going to talk about this afternoon oh, is rebirth, which is what the what the Buddha did is he took ideas that had been around for a long time, like reincarnation, and he re redefined them in a different way that totally changed their their significance, their implication. And, okay. okay sorry, and so, this is probably a good point to get into today's topic, which is karma. And karma is karma is uh, inextricably linked with reincarnation. And let me just explain to you why. I'll give you a history of these, of these thoughts. Long, long before the Buddha was born. Uh, People had been, people were aware that things had consequences. And there were many things in the world that people would like to control but didn't know how to control. Um, they tried to understand the forces that operated in the world. And they tried to devise ways to manipulate them. And as I'm sure you all realize, that there was a lot of deification of the natural forces in the world. And then there were rites and rituals developed in order to try to manipulate those forces. So there came to be rites uh, and rituals that were performed to ensure good rains during the growing season. Uh, and, well, in, in, everything from rites and rituals to in, ensure that uh, a pregnant woman's child was born without birth defects. You know, and all of these different things that affected people and were beyond their immediate control, uh, there, were, there were rites and rituals developed with the idea that by doing this particular action, you could bring about this particular kind of desirable result. I think you're all familiar with that as sort of the history of the development, the, the basis of religions and philosophies, and even science. Science is an extension of that, how we manipulate things to get the results we want. And this is really the seeds from which the idea of karma came. Things you do have consequences, and 
it seems like if you do good things, you have, should have good consequences, and if you do bad things, it should have bad consequences. And it does seem that for no obvious reason, good things happen to people, and bad things happen to people. So karma linked, it was similar to this process of the rites and rituals and controlling nature and so forth, was seeing there what was before them and, and establishing in their mind a link. Okay, so since people are always doing things, and some of the things they do are good, and some of the things are bad, and since all kinds of things are always happening to people, and some of those things are good, and some of those things are bad, it's only right and fair that there be a connection and that the good things that happen to you are a result of the good things that you do. And the bad things that happen to you are a result of the bad things that you do. So this was a way of thinking that was evolving. At the same time, people were concerned with the question of you know, what happens to me when I die? And the notion of reincarnation had become fairly popular. Well, these two quickly came together because one of the problems with the idea that if you do good things, good things will happen to you, and you do bad things, bad things will happen to you, is that we see a lot of exceptions around us. We see bad things happening to good people and good things happening to bad people. And reincarnation helps to resolve that. Okay, the good things you do and the good things that happen to you don't need to happen in the same lifetime. Reincarnation allows them to happen in different lifetimes. So this this solved that problem. Um, and so now karma is a word that means action. But as it was used, it came to mean it came to have a very specialized meaning. Because action just means action. You know, you hit a rock with a hammer and the rock breaks. That's an action and a consequence. But karma, instead of meaning that kind of action, had come to mean specifically a moral consequence of an action that reflected back on the person that did the action. Okay? That's what we mean when we say good things, or if you do good things, good things happen to you. We brought in the moral element. And the action of the hammer hitting the rock doesn't affect the person swinging the hammer, it affects the rock, the rock breaks. Okay. So karma had, had shifted this meaning. It was about moral consequences of action and about, about consequences to the doer of the action. So you see how that, that's a step beyond, that makes it into something quite different than just action. But that's what the word had come to mean long before the Buddha was born moral consequences of actions that devolve upon the person that performed the action. Okay? And by combining this with the idea of reincarnation so that you could make sense of the fact that good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people, this, this notion just got extended more and more until there came to be the idea that everything that happens is the result of karma. Uh, this explained all kinds of things. Well, first of all, it made the universe into a just and righteous place. Hmm. But in doing so, it was appealing to a, a tendency human beings have. We like retribution. And so, properly speaking, we should call this karmic retribution. Because we like people that do bad things to be punished. And we like people that do good things to be rewarded. And that's retribution. And it seems to be, it's like one of those inborn instincts we have, children, growing up instinctively or go in the direction of retribution. The dog chewed up your shoe, well, the dog may not know why you're, why you're doing it, but it makes sense to you to beat the hell out of the dog for chewing up your shoe. He deserves it. Mm -hmm. Although, 
we're, we are wiser than that, and we do recognize that there's a problem with retribution. Right? It's an interesting thing, though. We haven't really resolved that. We, uh, we have correction systems in this country, right? We like to believe that the correctional the purpose of the correctional system is to correct people that have done wrong. It's like punishing the dog for chewing up your shoe in a way that the dog knows it was because of the shoe, and therefore you're doing the dog a favor and yourself a favor by training the dog not to chew up the shoe in the future, right? But retribution isn't, it isn't the same thing as, as correction. And our correctional systems are really retribution systems. There's absolutely nothing correctional about them, right? Because we still have this human tendency. We, we want retribution. We think in a just universe there should be retribution. And this is what the law of karmic retribution appeals to. Because in your next life, when the misery befalls you, you have no idea what you did. But, uh, well, you might feel a little, little bit better about it if you believe that, well, I must deserve it, I must have done something, then maybe that'll make you feel a little bit better. Better? <laughs> I said maybe. I said maybe. It, it, it is, it's, to some degree, it does. For some people, it works that way. It, it, makes it, it makes some of the difficulties of life easier to bear. And... It really helped to support the caste system in India. Because mm -hmm. after all, if you were born in, into the untouchables, or if you were born a member of the, of the Brahmin caste, um, gee, it just it seems grossly unfair, right? Unless you say, well, I was born as an untouchable because I must have, I must have been a Brahmin who didn't perform the rites and rituals properly in my previous life, because that's what they said happened. That by performing the duty of the caste that you belong to, if you were a warrior or a merchant or a Brahmin or a laborer, then you, you perform your duty according to your caste. And if you do that really, really well, you'll be born into a higher caste. But if you fail in that, you'll be born into a lower caste. So, and... I, I think it's has succeeded really well. You know, it's it's the religion is the opiate of the people kind of thing. People born into the lower caste were able to tolerate better, tolerate it better, because they were raised believing that this was their just reward for something they did in a previous life. And if only they would accept it gracefully, and even gratefully and perform their duties appropriately and not act or think Rock about the their station, then they would be reborn in a higher caste. Of course, the problem is, I mean, the, the, the good thing about this law of karma is, okay, now I know what I need to do. If I want to be happy, then I'll perform lots of good actions and then good things will come to me in the future. And when I get reborn, I might get reborn in better circumstances. Of course, now if you do good things, and good things happen to you in this life, then you can say, oh, well, that's, that's great, I'm glad I did those good things, I'll keep on doing good things, uh, I'll, I'll be generous in this uh, beneficence that has fallen upon me. But what about you're born, and you, the good things happen to you in the next life, you're born in the good circumstances, but you don't remember anything about what you did to make all these good things happen to you. Right? Um, then you're likely to squander all of your good karma and make lots of bad karma and be born in bad circumstances in the next life because you don't remember. So, what I'm just saying is that while karmic retribution appeals to a very primitive instinct we have, karmic retribution doesn't really make sense. It may be a 
righteous and just universe that operates according to karmic retribution, but it's certainly not a rational universe. So, anyway, the world that Buddha was born into, though, karmic retribution and reincarnation were totally intertwined and established. Now, there were many different views on how karma worked, and there were different views on what happened long-term, process of retribution, and things like that. But these two notions were pretty well established, and they were very intertwined, because karma needed reincarnation in order to have any chance of being acceptable. And actually, people came to view it that karma was what drove reincarnation. That the reason you're reincarnated is because you've got all of these consequences awaiting you. So you have to be reincarnated in order to get your rewards and punishments. So karma became the driver for reincarnation. Now, the other thing that happened, and this was very prominent, in, in the period in which the Buddha was born into, is people have been believing this and thinking about this. This birth, suffering, death, rebirth, and karma, you, you know, and, and they realize that well, this, this gets to be pretty dreary. All is being reborn. And every time I'm reborn, I don't know what I did right, I don't know what I did wrong, and I'm really likely to screw up again. You look around the world and you see, boy, there's a lot of suffering going on. I want out of this. I want out of this cycle of birth, suffering, death, rebirth, more suffering, re-death, and on and on and on. And most of the religious practices of the time, in one form or another, were dedicated to getting you out of the cycle, to bringing it to an end. Which is really find it kind of funny, because the idea of reincarnation and karma comes to the West. And people like this. Oh, wow, this is reassuring. You know, I get to be reborn. And, you know. But once we've <laughs> lived with it, once we've lived with this, it, 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 if this were to become common notion. Once we live with it for a few centuries, it'll become obvious to us as it was to the people in the Buddhist time that this is not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious to know, why, why was it that people didn't know what they did good? I mean, was there no code of ethics, really? Oh, no. We're code of ethics, but you, can you remember your last life? Do you know what you did that was responsible for all the problems you've had? Well, I mean, if, if I had problems, I mean, there, there are plenty of things I could have done. I mean, specifically, yeah. no, but I mean, I could have, if, you know, if I thought I had a past life and things were going wrong in this one, I could guess. If, if you were born into that time, you would have been taught the, the moral codes of your yeah. community. Right. And you would have been taught this doctrine, and the doctrine of karma and reincarnation would have been intended to motivate you to follow the the, the, the moral sure. code of your community. That would be the whole point of it. Right. But when bad things happen to you, you don't know what you did. You mean specifically? What? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you don't know. And good things happen to you the same thing. And they have the human tendency. I mean, we. We teach our children in the West, you know, be good and God will love you and go to heaven, be bad and you'll go to hell. You just have to do everything good. And <laughs> does everybody automatically be good because of that? <laughs> no, they don't. Well, they don't believe in heaven and hell, maybe. Well, e even the people that believe in it can't. Oh, yeah, yeah, even course. the people that believe in it can't make themselves necessarily always. Some do a better job than others. Yeah. Yeah. In, a, in a copy of the Three Pillars of Zen, in the glossary section, was a definition of karma. And all the other issues, all the other glossary things were like two or three lines. The one on karma was like a half page. Yeah. Right. And in it, it hinted at the ability to predict your future. 
by observing your your habitual karmic actions. And basically what it was saying was, you keep doing these kinds of things, you can tell where you're going to end up mm -hmm. um, by observing it, which hints at a little different view of, of uh, it's like it's like karma in the present instead of even considering reincarnation. Well, not knowing what I, I, that, that paragraph says, but you see, a, a truly Buddhist view of karma is much more about this lifetime, and it's not about reincarnation. And so, from the three pillars of Zen, I would assume there would be at least some element of that in it. But uh, right now, I'm just trying to paint the picture of the idea of karma that existed in the world prior to the Buddha, because the Buddha totally redefined karma. Okay? And so we'll come back to that. Yeah? So the old way, pre-Buddha, really struggled to try and connect which bad things were followed by which bad Oh, karma. some some did. There were but, different views. But okay, so and there were different theories. So was there ever one that kind of just took it global? You did something that sucked. Uh, uh, you will have something that sucks happen to you. Sure. They won't match up. They will just be yeah. gravity sucks. Yeah, there were all kinds of views. Okay. Okay. Any logical interpretation you come with, there was some school of thought that supported it. But, and, and, and those schools of thought about how karma worked had a direct role in determining where, how you escaped from this process. Now the suffering of this life and the, this reincarnation process came to be known as samsara. The cycle, the, 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 the cyclic, uh, the cycle of suffering, death, rebirth, suffering, death, rebirth. And so this life in this world, this life in this world was samsara, and its continuation in the next life, and the next life, and the next was samsara. And so the religious goal became the escape from samsara, and the views that developed about karma uh, uh, determined what you had to do in order to escape from samsara and bring yourself to an end. <laughs> and of course, there were different views about what happened when you brought yourself to an end. Okay, you could just one that was popular was annihilation. That when you succeeded, you you finally were annihilated. When you died, you really died. The pre-Buddha, was a... This is all pre-Buddhist. Okay. All pre-Buddhist. Okay. When you died, you really died. It was finally over with, once and for all. Okay. Others were that when you became liberated, you, in, instead of being annihilated, you became liberated from samsara. And when you became liberated from samsara, then uh, you became one with Brahman, the, the source of everything. And there were views that, that actually the whole world and everybody in it, that, that, that uh, Brahman was sleeping and this was all just a dream. And what happened when, um, when you did everything right is that you disappeared from Brahman's dream. Right? <laughs> there were all kinds of different views about this. But they all came down to some kind of annihilation of this self that gets reborn, because that was seen as the problem in those days. There were a group called the Jains. And they looked at it and they said, well, they made a very astute observation that you cannot live without causing harm to other beings. It's impossible. And that the only way that you could escape from samsara was to stop making this bad karma that's the result of living and to, uh, to basically use up all the bad consequences of your previous bad karma. So, 
to be a Jain meant, first of all, to try to absolutely minimize the bad karma you made by causing harm to other beings, which you did by sweeping the path before you put each made each step so that you didn't step on a little bug or worm or something like that. Wearing a filter over your face, a, a mask over your face so that you didn't inhale any tiny living organisms. And filtering the water you drink. And then when you were ready, when you felt like you had, were ready to do this, the ultimate spiritual act of a Jain was to stop in place, right where they are, and not move, and not eat, and not drink until they died. And in the days, the hours and days of suffering that it took to die while sitting in immobility, not eating or drinking, that was the suffering that consumed your bad karma. That was one view. Another view, this is probably the one uh, that was held by the two, the first two teachers of the Buddha, is that you enter into a transcendental state, a really profound meditation, a trance, where you, your experience of yourself as a self has disappeared. That's a trance-like state. There's no conscious experience or anything like that. And that is as close as a human being can come according to this theory. That's as close as a human being can come to the primordial state of non-being before Brahman launched them into the cycle of samsara. And these, these trance-like meditative states, they're called the formless jhanas. Um, or of course, there's no suffering while you're sitting in the jhana, in, in, in the jhana. And when you get up from the jhana, you have kind of this blissful afterglow. So what this meant is once you've mastered the, this practice, and you spend the rest of your time, life spending as much time as you could in this blissful state of jhana, and uh, enjoying the afterglow when you had to come out of it to eat and go to the bathroom and do the other things that we have to do in life. So it made the samsara of this life a lot more tolerable. But the real payoff is that if you spent enough time in this primordial state, when you die, instead of being reincarnated, you would enter into that state permanently. And there were all kinds of other... There was, there was a, a school of thought that believed that you know, there was absolutely nothing you could do, like the Jains were trying to take control of their karma. There was a school of thought that said there's absolutely nothing you can do to control your karma. But every now and then, you reach this lucky place where you, you've kind of reached a balance. You've, you've, uh, you've, you're, you're almost karma-less. Almost karma-less. Okay? You, you, you've, you've been using up your karma at a really rapid rate, and you've been not making any new karma. And so you reach this point where you're almost karma-less. And, this, and when you reach that state, if you're really, really careful not to make any more karma, then when you die, then it'll all be over with. There'll be no, there won't be enough karma left to launch you into another life. So there are a lot of different views like that around. But they're all about less escape from samsara, less escape from the cycle of reincarnation. And let's, one way or another, let's try to understand now, of course, there were people that didn't buy into this whole thing at all. They said, it's a bunch of rot. So, we live, and then when we die, we're dead, and that's it. You know, forget this kind of stuff. And they, they, they taught hedonism, and they were basically amoral. I mean, they recognized that if you did bad things, bad things might happen to you. Karma notwithstanding. Therefore, if you wanted to live a good life as a successful hedonist, you tried not to hurt people because they were going to come back at you <laughs> if you did. Right? So they were. So they avoided a lot of the worst kinds of behaviors 
not out of morality, but out of amorality. They didn't believe that there was any justice in the world at all. Therefore, what it made sense to do is have as good a time as you can during this life, which meant being careful. And then when it's over, it's over, and you guys can sit and starve yourself to death if you want, and you other guys can sit and meditate your life away if you want, but me, I'm going to have a good time. Sounds kind of like an existentialist. <laughs> yeah, well, and there's all different degrees. Yeah. So you've got a picture of the world that, they, that the Buddha came into. But certainly, as soon as he was able to talk, he was hearing about karmic retribution and reincarnation. These were not Buddha's ideas. Right? And later when he left home and he went on his search, his exploration, uh, he encountered the teachers of these dharmas and he basically saw various problems with them. For one thing, he wanted, he wanted an answer to suffering in this life. And all of these other methods said, you know, you can't do it in this life, it has to happen after you die. And don't count on necessarily being make it making it this next death. You may have to be reborn a few thousand times and die again before you get there. And he didn't like that. He wouldn't buy into it. He said, "I want, I want, I want liberation in this life. Don't talk to me about other lives." And he stuck to that for his whole life. When people asked him questions about. Uh, about what happens after you die and future lives and stuff. He says, don't waste your time thinking about that. Focus on liberation in this life. And uh, he achieved his awakening at age 35. He lived to be 80 years old. He spent 45 years living in this world as an awakened being. That, that is a total denial of the views that were held prior to that time, right? Prior to that time, yeah, uh, well, to give you a clear example of that, after his awakening, he was walking along the road and he met uh, another uh, mendicant monk, spiritual person, who, who said, uh, said, you look really different. There's something special about you. What, what, what is it? And he said, I'm awakened. This guy, Udaka, said, Okay, see you around. <laughs> because all, all, only crazy people said things like that. Everybody knew how hard it was to become awakened. And you didn't become awakened in this life. I mean, if you succeeded, it happened after you died. But that fellow, Udaka, if he had talked to, to typical Tibetan Buddhist, he did not have said, yeah, right, yeah, 10,000 lifetimes, at least, maybe 10 million. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or if he talked to typical Theravadan, <laughs> yeah, it's really, really, really rare. I don't think there's been an arhat in the world since uh, maybe 200 years after the Buddha died. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he would have, Udaka would have felt very comfortable with those points of view. Would the Buddha know? What would the Buddha have said if he talked to one of these Theravadins or Tibetans or whatever? He said he would have said, I spent my whole life teaching that you could become liberated in this lifetime. And that and that that's what you should be focusing on doing. Forget future lifetimes. When people Ask me about future lifetimes, I said, that's a waste of time. Thinking about where you came from and where you're going to go to, that's a waste of time. You should be devoting your attention and your energies to achieving your liberation in this lifetime. So you see, right from the beginning, the Buddha was on a different track from these things that had been previously taught and were widely believed. Samsara. This world and human existence were identified as samsara. And reincarnation was the continuation of samsara. But the Buddha lived in this world as an awakened being for 45 years in human form. So if we look at that, we have to realize that this, you know, this is saying something really important to us. 
It's saying that liberation is not about escaping human life. It's not about escaping this world. And nirvana is not some other place or state that you escape to. You don't leave samsara and go to nirvana. Samsara and nirvana, either one, can happen here. Really what he did is internalized the idea of nirvana and samsara. You made this human life and you made this world samsara, but you could make this human life and, and this uh, your existence in this world into nirvana. It's up to you. He moved it from out there to in here. That was the big shift he made there. So then, what was this idea of karma? Okay? And it was very common, and people would always bring it up to him. One, one person came up to him, and he said, uh, is it true that everything that happens to you is karma? It's the result of karma, of your karma. And this was, this was a very popular view at the time. I mean, there were different views of karma. But very popular was the idea that everything was the result of karma. Now, the Buddha, in his, in his awakening, had thoroughly examined dependent origination. And the problem with this view of karma is it stands in direct contradiction to dependent origination. If everything's due to karma, it negates every other kind of causality. It makes everything due to one particular kind of cause. But the Buddha responded by saying, no. No, everything is not due to karma. So now that's an interesting thing. You've got the Buddha disputing what a lot of people who belong to Buddhist religions would say is the case. Yeah. Um, which sutra is this that he said no? What's that? Which sutra? Oh, I don't remember the, the, the name of it. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think you maybe could find that? Oh, I know, I know I could find it if I spent a little while digging around for it, yes. Um, actually, if you, go, if you go online and, I believe, get the handout from the uh, Buddha Dharma Comes to the West uh, teaching that I gave, I think I refer to that sutra in the, and I think I might identify my name. But anyway, the Buddha's teaching on causality is that there are five kinds of causality, of which karma is only one. There is physical causality. That's like physics and chemistry. There's biological causality. That's, um, we would say that that's, we would describe that in terms of DNA and all kinds of other things, but basically, we see in the world that in addition to everything that's happening due to physics and chemistry that oak trees come from acorns and kittens come from cats and uh, there's a lot of cons consistency and causality in that. That living things do something that non-living things don't. Living things grow, living things maintain themselves, living things uh, repair and heal themselves. So there's a whole realm of biological causality. But as we know, and as the Buddha seemed to understand, biological causality is rooted in physical causality. And then the psychological causality. You do something mean to somebody, they're likely to hit you, or strike back in some way. Uh, psychological, anything that has a mind, you know, out of all of the things in the world that are alive, that have been produced as a result of biological causality, there is a subset that have minds, right? Trees don't, dogs do, and so forth. And if you look at any, any being that has a mind, we can, it, it behaves in ways that are consistent and predictable, which we could describe as psychology. So, you understand the psychology of a particular being, then you understand why it is that they behave in the particular way they do. So that's mental causality. 
That's the third kind of causality. The fourth kind of causality is karma. And karma only applies to that particular set of living beings that have minds whose minds are pliable and can change. Who basically, you know, a lizard, you can't train a lizard, lizards can't learn, right? There's a lot of beings with minds that, that their minds are hardwired. They operate on the basis of instincts that they're born with, and they, they can't change themselves very much. But humans are different than, human minds are different than these other kinds of minds, is that, that we learn, we change, and we change ourselves. And this is the realm in which karmic causality works, according to the Buddha. Now what the Buddha did is he redefined karma. Remember, at that time, karma meant karma meant an action that produced moral consequences that reflected upon the person that did the action. And the word karma applied to action. So he refined it, he redefined it. He said, when I say karma, I mean intention. That every, every movement of the mind, every word you speak, and every act you perform arises out of an intention. So every action arises out of an intention, and I define karma as intention. When I say karma, I mean intention. So he made a big shift there. Okay, let's, let's reword this in terms of the previous view. What he said is that, that the moral consequences of, in, of your intentions are what reflects back on you as the producer of that intention. Your actions produce effects in the world through physical and chemical causality. If you throw a handful of rocks in the air, some of them are going to land on your head. If you touch that match to the gunpowder, it's going to blow up in your face. They happen due to biological causality. Uh, you get sick. You get pregnant. All these things. Or happen due to the laws of biological causality. Your actions in the world, if you hit somebody, they're probably going to hit you back. That's psychological causality. He said, but when I say karma, I mean intention. And this happens within the realm of karma causality. It doesn't happen out there. The results of your actions happen due to, in the material world are due to physical, biological, and psychological causality. But the intention behind your action has an immediate effect on you and your own mind. And that is the consequence of the karma. So you see, that is a really... He did the same thing here that he did with samsara and nirvana. He took it from out there and brought it in here. He took karma from out there, both both the action of karma and the consequences of karma from out there. And karma became intention, and the consequences became the effect that it had on you internally. And this is Buddhist karma. Buddhist karma is how we create ourselves. Yeah? So, so the act of being hit, let's say, is not is not karma, but how you perceive that being hit, in other words, like, oh, I just got a realization, thank you, you know, or like, how dare you hit me? That, that is, would be the result of, that would be your good karma coming back. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so the things that happen to us is not related physically, exactly. it's how we're perceiving them. Exactly. Karma is not about what happens to you, it's about who it happens to. The other problem with karmic retribution... And everything's random. What's that? And everything else is random. Oh, no, it has... Actually, been... nothing is random. Everything is due to causes and conditions. But, but if you were to walk down the street and come upon... Good. It wasn't like I hit you and you hit me back. Or yeah, you're in a car, right. you know... Yeah, let's say you're walking down the street and uh, a little piece of space junk, a little meteorite <laughs> has been traveling through space 
for the last hundred million years, <laughs> you know, comes down and it hits you in the foot. Right. That's not because of anything you did. <laughs> right. That's just that's just I the just operation of physical from, causality. Right. right. Just like that yeah. in my head. So what happens to one's that's right. Or How you like react to being hit by a little piece of meteorite, that's that's your karma. If it makes you suffer, oh. then that's your karma. If it doesn't make you suffer, that's your karma. Right. That's that's what karma is. So the key is not to take it personal. Don't take it personally, that's right. Yes. <laughs> Don't take it personally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's, it sure seems to me like there were a lot of people that weren't listening. They sure were. When when the Buddha <laughs> redefined karma, oh, yeah. because okay. because the yeah. older definition of karma is what is, is know, yeah. seeped into the culture, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. even yeah. Western culture. I know. Yeah. And it's exactly. still there. Yeah. Yeah. We have to correct this misperception. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> we exactly. can all do that too. We can all do that. But what you're going to find is that it is, it's so, everything the Buddha taught is so beautifully consistent and it's so powerful when you understand mm -hmm. it. It's so amazingly powerful. You see, the old view of karma, the idea that, you know, if I do good things, good things will happen to me, and if I do bad things, bad things will happen to me. Uh, the idea was, well, I want good things to happen to me because that is what will make me happy, and I don't want bad things to happen to me because that's what causes my suffering. What did Buddha say was the cause of suffering? Ignorance and delusion. What, what was the delusion? It's the belief that your happiness and your suffering depend on what happens to you. So, I mean, you know, everything else the Buddha taught comes back to this that says that if you think that trying to manipulate the world is the way for you to be happy and avoid suffering, what you're actually going to do is you're just going to reinforce the very thing that's making you suffer. Right? So, um, if you think that, that, okay, if I give money away, all this money is going to come to me and I'm going to be really rich, even if, it, even if that happened, and, and it, it, it could, you know, if you made a big show of giving money to people and told everybody, see, now I'm going to get really rich as a result of that, you know, and uh, then they come and they give you lots of money because they want to get rich too. <laughs> You'll get rich, but you're the smooth talker, you're the only one that gets rich, the rest of them are just out of pocket. <laughs> sure, but does all that money that you get from being a smooth talker does that make you happy? Well, it might temporarily. You might feel really good about having all this money. But most likely, it's just increased your attachment to material things. And you're going to lose those material things. You know, uh, It's increased your belief that your happiness comes from what you have uh, or, or not getting what you don't want. And so, so when you're... Uh, uh, when your wife says to you, um, gee, it's great you've got all this money now, dear, but we live in a joint property state, and so uh, I'm filing for a divorce, and I want my half in cash. <laughs> but yeah. if you gave lots of money with the intention to always have enough so that you could you know, be able to, let's say, practice, you know? You would be a person who believed you had to have enough. No, but but <laughs> but, but this is the point. Anything can be enough. That's so right. So if you've yes, created right. that, yeah. that in itself is the karma, the intention. Yeah. So then you are, you've, you might feel you always have enough whether money came back or money didn't come back. Mm -hmm. But the intention of that, to feel like you have enough, if that was the intention. Well, whatever you can do to instill in yourself the idea that well, basically, let's, let's talk about what karma is according to the Buddha, okay? Uh, it, intention, it is intention, and what makes, what makes an intention good karma versus what makes an intention bad karma? So what makes an intention bad karma is that it comes from desire or aversion. 
and you can have mixed heart. You can have you you can have some good motivations, but as long as there's some desire or aversion in there, some some fear of what will happen in the future, it's still going to have an element of bad karma. So, bad karma is motivated by desire and aversion, and it comes from the view that that your happiness depends on what you have or don't have, and your unhappiness depends on, likewise, that your happiness and unhappiness depend on what you have and you don't have. Good karma, on the other hand, comes from its opposite, generosity, non-greed, uh, non-aversion, loving kindness, compassion, patience, these other things. Um, and it it's motivated by those things, and it comes from the view that my happiness comes from within, and as, as does my suffering, and that for me to find true bliss and complete uh, freedom from suffering, I need to achieve wisdom and I need to overcome desire and aversion. So, the, so these are good and bad karma for those intentions. And the result of your good karma is that you become a person who is less, less burdened by desire and aversion. Bad karma makes you more, more driven by it even than before. So you suffer more no matter what happens to you. Your good karma weakens that. It also moves you. It, it changes your mind in a way that you become more open to the realization of the way things really are, to seeing, to having insight into the three characteristics, and to dropping the delusion that has been the driver of your craving and the cause of your suffering. So the consequence of good karma is that it moves you towards nirvana, and it moves you in the direction of less suffering. It makes you a person who's going to to the degree that you've made good karma, no matter what happens to you, you're going to suffer less as a result. Bad karma moves you further away from nirvana and towards more suffering, so that no matter what happens to you, even if people give you more money, you're more likely to suffer as a result. So that's the Buddhist karma. Now, there is a mixture of things. And when you, when you start out on the path, there's going to be a lot of mixture, right? I'm going to do good things. Why am I going to do good things? Well, I don't yet have a huge amount of love and compassion in my, uh, loving kindness and compassion in my heart. And my generosity is limited. I'm willing to give so much, but then I need the rest. And so, yeah, initially your, 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 your karma is mixed. And so you work on yourself to try to purify your karma. Basically, to purify your intentions. To understand more and more clearly your intentions. Blindly giving away everything you have in the hopes that something good is going to happen to you in the future, even if the something good is to become enlightened, is going to be relatively ineffective. It, it's going to have, one thing, it's going to have some good consequences in the world. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But it's really, it's tainted by, it, it's still coming from that place, well, I'm the separate self, and I need to be enlightened so that I feel good and I'm happy. Well, what about if it's I need to be enlightened if it's not the Hinayana view, but rather the greater, the greater view? Of, yeah, see, of, that, that's, that's the value of that. Yes, the more that you can bring that in. Right. And in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, what I'm saying is it's going to be mixed. You're okay. going to try to bring that in, but it's still going to be tainted. But, but that's all right. It's but, better than if you did kept on going the way that you were. But, but if you were like, I'm doing this for the sake of becoming enlightened, for the sake of helping all beings. Yes. Like right. that very <clears throat> vital right. last part. Yes. Right. However, it came to remind yeah. you that yeah, so back to what you originally said. If you, if, if you said, I'm going to live as simply as I can because I, I want to devote my life to practicing the Dharma and becoming awakened. And, and not only that, I, I, I want to do this so I can help other people become awakened. If you said that. And so you're living simply. But to live simply, you still need to work. 
And so you try to set aside some of the money from what you earn so that in the future you can spend even less time working and even more time either practicing or helping guide other people to their own awakening. Well, then that's all, that's all really good. Yeah. That's all really good. Now, what you do when somebody, you see somebody that's in need, right. and you can take some of your savings, but I'm, I'm saving this so that I can become a Buddha. You know. mm. <laughs> and if I give it to you, you're going to go spend it on a hamburger, and then I won't have it anymore. But, but wouldn't it be better to just give it? Or some, some, well, some balance? Mm. I mean, I, I, you know, Here's an interesting thing good, about it. But, mm. Karma, understanding karma says you have to examine your intentions. What you actually do not is not important. Right. Whether you decide to keep the money in your savings mm. account or give it to the right. needy, hungry person, that's not what it's about. It's about why you do whichever you do. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's a really key thing to understand. Mm. Yeah. In this model, can there be such a thing as enlightened self-interest? I give you the thousand dollars now to make your house payment so I don't have to deal with the fact that you'll spend 35 years living under an interstate overpass eating kitty tuna. Now, if I give, if you give me the thousand dollars, so that you can nice. make, make the check out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get if that you thousand give me bucks, the, to the degree that you give me the thousand dollars out of love, to keep you out of the underpass, yeah, to the degree that you give it to me out of love, Mm-hmm. That's pure good karma. But to the degree that it's tainted by the hope that you'll get some reward in the future, it's then it, there's a mixture well, of bad well, karma. Well, my reward in the future would be I don't have to bring the red raglan flyer full of kitty tuner to you. I don't have to, you know, deal with your homelessness. And that's I that's that's very selfish of me. That's right. Yeah, and that's right. So the so if you're giving me the thousand dollars purely out of love, then that means that even if I blow the thousand dollars and you end up still having to bring me the wagon full of kitty tuna, wagon full of kitty tuna you don't mind. Then you've done it truly out of love. <laughs> if there's a string attached that says, I'm going to give you this thousand dollars, but I expect not to have to drag this wagon load of tuna around, <laughs> then, okay, the then it's, it's still the pretty good, but it's tainted. So it's, it's the strings attached that that is revelatory. Okay. Yeah. And that's all right. Don't feel bad about yourself because there are strings attached. As a matter of fact, the best thing you can do is be totally aware of the strings that are attached and say, okay, yeah, I'm doing a good thing, but I can see the strings. Because by seeing the strings and understanding the strings, next time there won't be as many strings. Yeah. One more. Um, so, if you're doing something out of love, and then you're doing that same thing out of love, but with the intention to reach enlightenment for the sake of all beings, yeah. then does that intention, um, is it stronger and therefore brings you closer, faster? Um, I, um, I understand this is all um, imbued with the ignorance of mm -hmm. an individual self going somewhere. Um, so, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. How, how strong... How how, karma. how strong the karma that you make in the moment. It, it depends on a combination of the clarity that you have and uh, and and how you how you experience. It's going to be a very subjective kind of thing. Like if you never had the intention to become enlightened involved in your loving actions, mm -hmm. would you still get there? Oh yes, you would. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You don't. Like you 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 don't need to realize where the path that you're on goes in order to achieve the end of to reach the end of the path. So as long as you're walking down the path, you may not know where it leads. But that doesn't matter. But like Buddha really wanted to learn something. He did. You know? He re like there was an intention to understand. You know. Yeah. If you're like a loving person, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, as much as one can, you know, be without practicing it, yeah. you know. Because if you're going to practice, or if you are trying to be mm -hmm. mindful, there is some other... Yeah. The, to, to hold to, to hold to the ideal of, of, of bodhicitta, the bodhisattva 
you, that I am doing this not for myself, but for the benefit of all beings. That's a very useful tool to have. It's, it's just, it's one more thing that you can use to, to bring yourself to act in a positive, uh, in a positive way. But <clears throat> keep in mind that your bodhicitta is only a facsimile of bodhicitta until you've actually realized the truth. Yeah. Do you think we could take a ten minute break? Oh, a break? Oh yeah, I, I, I forgot we've been sitting here for almost two hours. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I, want to, I have a real hard time with what we're saying about the, the compassion, absolute no, no strings attached and whatever, mm -hmm. but as a parent, yeah. It's very difficult because sometimes you can be as compassionate and as loving as you mm -hmm. can, but then the lack of strings attached might might turn into a, a, a it's very difficult because sometimes well the parenting requires for the child to learn. Mm -hmm. So if you just give totally selflessly right. then they have no responsibility you know in in appreciating even what you're giving. That's you right. So the parental role gets in the way. The parental role it, it involves a lot of genuine love and compassion, but it also comes with lots of strings attached and there's a lot of selfishness. We identify with our children. And so what we do for our children's benefit often becomes a kind of selfishness. But it's, it's a wonderful arena in which to, to work and explore and discover all of this. Because it does, it does have all of those elements. And it, it gives you an opportunity to see them in action and to work with them. Okay, let's take a 15 minute break then.